Well, this is a webinar about the case of um, of Miller and Owen Mitchell, and it's always um, very useful at the beginning just to explain some background about um, what actually the case was all about. So um, this is a personal injury claim at the heart of the case involving a claimant who was injured on a package holiday in Turkey. Um, she fell down the stairs, had a nasty fracture to her leg, and the hotel and the tour operator were notified about the accident at the time. And that's a pretty important detail for reasons that we're going to come along to in a moment. Um, unfortunately, the tour operator failed to notify its insurers of the accident. And the insurance policy required the tour operator to give prompt notification both of claims, but also of accidents that might turn into claims. And um, for some reason, they didn't do so. Now, the defendant solicitors um, operate a legal helpline, and the claimant saw an advert for the legal helpline, and shortly after the accident, she contacted the helpline. Um, in the course of her call with the helpline, she was given some initial legal advice, including that there was a three-year limitation period, which was perfectly correct. The legal helpline referred the case to the defendant's travel litigation team, and they got in touch with the claimant very soon afterwards, I believe it was the next day, and requested uh, various documents from the claimant so that they could decide whether they were going to take the case or not. Uh, now, the claimant was in the course of having medical treatment. She was in hospital um, and she was very slow at getting back to the defendant with the documents that they'd asked for. Um, eventually, though, she did send the documents and um, the solicitors took the case on and a letter of claim was sent to the defendants. And that was about two years after the accident. And as you'd expect, the tour operator, once it received the letter of claim, notified its insurers. Uh, unfortunately, by that time, the tour operator had run out of money. It was insolvent and the insurers refused to meet the claim because of the late notification. As I said um, at the beginning, the tour operator knew about the accident at the time, has an obligation to uh, report accidents to the tour operator, but didn't do so until they received the letter of claim. So the claimant was left in a pretty difficult position. Um, she couldn't um, really proceed with the claim against the tour operator because they had no money, and she couldn't claim against the insurers because the insurers had valid reason to reject the claim, which was late notification. So instead, the claimant sued her solicitors, and she argued that uh, there was a retainer from the time of the telephone call or shortly afterwards, an implied retainer. And she also argued that whether or not there was a retainer, there was a common law duty of care from the time of the call or shortly afterwards by reason of assumption of responsibility. And she argued that um, this duty required advising the claimant to take steps to try and ensure that the tour operator notified its insurers. And that needed to be the claimant's argument because she had to say the solicitors were required to do something which would have provoked the tour operator to notify their insurers, essentially in time, so that later down the line, there wouldn't be a problem with late notification. And this gives rise to a number of issues as set out on this slide. And Henk and I are going to split these uh, issues between us. The first issues that arise are about solicitors' retainers. How are they formed? And at what point, at what stage, does a potential client turn into an actual client? And at what stage do the solicitors um, become under an obligation to start acting and to start advising? Um, also, when will a retainer be implied, even if there isn't actually a formal uh, written retainer. And then finally, uh, when will there be an assumption of responsibility to advise on something, even if there's no retainer at all? And I'm going to hand you over to Henk now, because Henk is going to um, talk all about express and implied retainers. And then I'll pick up on the question of assumption of responsibility in a moment.
So Hank, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So as Andrew noted, I I'm going to be talking about one particular aspect of this case, namely the alleged existence and effect of an express, alternatively implied retainer. So in, in the first part, I'm going to make some introductory remarks and, and touch on some of the core guiding principles in this particular area. In, in the second part, I'm going to trace how the issues arose in the context of Miller, both at first instance and on appeal, and how the issues were decided. Uh, and in the final part, I'll try to draw the threads together and I'll also deal with some questions which have been provided uh, prior to the webinar today. So some, some brief introductory remarks about retainers. You will all, I'm sure, be familiar with the concept of a retainer. And I don't think it's controversial to say that retainers play a very important role in a lawyer's practice. Retainers are important, firstly, from a regulatory perspective. The SRA's information requirements, as I'm sure you will be aware, include the provision of sufficiently clear information on issues relating to cost, clients' obligations, uh, and the nature of the services due to be provided. And, and a retainer forms an important part of that obligation. And, and the Law Society, in particular, ha has produced helpful guidance on this. Retainers are also important from the perspective of professional negligence litigation. And that's because in virtually every case, the starting point of the analysis will be the question of what the client engaged the solicitor to do or advise upon. That analysis will centre specifically on what is stated in the retainer. In fact, in the Minkin decision, which I have cited in the slide, Lord Justice Jackson went so far as to state that, quote, the extent of a solicitor's duty to his or her client it is determined by his, her retainer, his or her retainer. Uh, now, in many, perhaps most cases, there will be very little scope for debate about what the effect of a written retainer is. The wording of the retainer may be clear, the retainer, the retainer will detail the services which are due to be provided, uh, and the only question will be whether those services were provided with professional care and skill. In, in terms of the leading authorities on express or implied retainers, they, they typically have one, one of three different fact patterns. The first is where the party's agreement was made orally without being committed to writing and there are competing views as to what specifically was agreed during those oral discussions. The, the second fact pattern is where there is an express written retainer but the document doesn't fully capture the extent of the services which have already been provided or, or the services which are due to be provided and there's a dispute as to the actual scope of the obligation. And the third fact pattern is where there is no retainer, express or implied, and the claimant's claim fails at the first hurdle because it was not owed the contractual duties alleged. I'm not able to go through the first and second fact patterns in, in too much detail today, but Miller, as will be seen, is in some ways an archetypal example of the third fact pattern. Uh, that is a case where there is no express or implied retainer between the solicitor and the client uh, during the period in which the alleged breach occurred. So, first principles. When I refer to express retainers, I am referring specifically to a contractual agreement which imposes duties on the solicitor to carry out specific services. And just like any other contract, a claimant will need to establish the well-known requirements for contractual formation. So firstly, they'll need to show that there was a sufficiently clear and unambiguous offer which deals with the key terms of the agreement. Secondly, they'll need to show that the offer was accepted. Thirdly, they'll need to show that there was a mutual intention to create legal relations. <clears throat> 
And fourthly, they will need to show that there is adequate consideration. Now, I've cited a case again in the slide, uh, Caliendo, in, in which Mr. Justice Arnold, uh, as he then was, analysed these requirements in a very methodical way. I, I don't have any time to review that decision today, but, uh, but again, I've, in I've included the citation in the slide in case anyone wanted to read the judgment after the talk. Now, the reported cases show that some issues arise more than others. The first hurdle for a claimant to establish is that an offer was made and accepted. You will all be aware of the fundamental doctrinal distinction between an offer and an invitation to treat. And an invitation to treat is, in effect, an invitation to a person to make an offer. And, and this is a distinction which arose for consideration in Miller, so I'll, I'll come back to that. A another issue which frequently arises is the question of what services the solicitor agreed to provide under the retainer. In, in other words, what is the scope of the contractual duty? Now, a particularly controversial area, which has given rise to quite a lot of uh, litigation, is the point of principle that uh, it's implicit in a solicitor's retainer that he or she will proffer advice which is reasonably incidental to the work that he or she is carrying out. Now, to use a crude example, if a businessman with 20 years of experience dealing with contracts on a day-to-day -day basis instructs a solicitor to draft a contract, that businessman or woman will not necessarily need advice on the basic features of that contract. And that advice, again, depending on the circumstances, uh, may not be reasonably incidental to the services due to be provided. On the flip side, if a solicitor is drafting a settlement agreement on behalf of a claimant who has suffered or a client who has suffered life-changing injuries and the client is not familiar with that contract, it will be implicit that some basic advice regarding the provisions of that contract are reasonably incidental to the instruction. Uh, now, I've the case has arisen, I, I previously cited uh, Minken and Landsberg, and, and that is a useful case which illustrates the court's approach to this. And I'm, I'm not going to be able to go into it in, in too much detail today, but I, I would suggest that you read the case of Minken and Landsberg if you wanted to see an illustration. So moving to implied retainers. In terms of the classic analysis of contractual formation, the implication uh, of a retainer arises when an offer is made and accepted through conduct. Importantly, that is a distinct scenario to one where an express retainer is offered and accepted through oral conversations. There you have an express retainer, albeit one which was formed pursuant to, uh, again, oral discussions. Now, the general rule is that the claimant will need to show that the parties have acted in a way which is consistent only with an intention to make a contract. And, and so put another way, if, if the parties would or might have acted in the same way in the absence of a contract, then the requisite necessity for implication is unlikely to be established. Uh, the, and, and really the important point is you, you are looking specifically at conduct. So how, how did these issues arise in, in the context of the Miller decision? Now, my talk, unlike Andrew's perhaps, is, is largely focused on the decision of first instance. Uh, and the reason for that is, is simply because the express implied retainer issue had a much more pr prominent role at trial, whereas the arguments on appeal were more tightly focused on the duty of care in tort. So, how were the arguments put at first instance? 
Now, the claimant advanced various arguments regarding the formation of an express retainer. The, the first argument was that an express retainer was formed on 19th of April 2015, uh, and shortly thereafter, uh, sorry, 19th of Nineteenth of uh, May, twenty fourteen. Yes, so nineteenth of May, twenty fourteen, uh, and the basic factual case on this was as follows. So on the nineteenth of May, the claimant was in hospital. She saw a tele uh, television ad for for the defendant's legal helpline. She called the helpline on the nineteenth of May, asked for a call back. The same day, she got a call back from a Miss Halliwell, who was a legal helpline advisor. During this call, Miss Miller was advised of the scope of the legal helpline. She was given some account of personal injury law in terms of duty, breach and causation. And she was advised that there was a three year limitation period. And that call ended with Miss Miller being told that, um, or Miss Miller's case being referred to the defendant's travel law group. Now, the claimant argued that the television ad amounted to an offer to provide legal services and that the claimant accepted that offer when she telephoned the defendant and the defendant did not decline to act for her but gave advice and told her it was passing the case to the travel law group. Um, so, in summary, the first argument, there's an express retainer which was entered into by virtue of the offer made in the television ad, and that offer was accepted by the claimant calling the helpline. Alternatively, an express retainer was reached by the end of the call on the basis that the defendant did not decline to act for her and told her it was passing the case to the travel law group. And the question was, was that sufficient to form an express retainer which imposed duties on the defendant of the kind alleged by the claimant? The judge held uh, that it was not, and the key points were as follows. Firstly, the television ad did not amount to an offer of the kind which was capable of being accepted and resulting in a binding contract. It was not an offer to provide legal services. It, it was an invitation to the public to call the helpline to see if the defendant could help by providing legal services. Secondly, Merely by telephoning the helpline, the claimant could not be regarded as agreeing to enter into a contract with the defendant. The, the, the offer in the advertisement contained none of the terms which would have been required to govern a contract of retainer. In terms of the argument that a retainer had been formed by the end of the call, that, that again was rejected. Uh, the, the, the key points were, firstly, the fact that the case had been passed to the travel law group uh, could not be regarded as an indication that a retainer had been agreed. Uh, the judge held, in fact, that it was an indication that a retainer had not been agreed because the defendant was basically saying that they would require further information before a retainer was entered into. Uh, the, the second point was that there was no agreement that the claimant would be responsible for the defendant's fees. And the judge remarked in passing that it would be very surprising if the claimant was sent a bill following this discussion on the telephone line. Um, and, and that was suggestive of the fact that, objectively assessed, she was being treated merely as a potential client. And so the claimant's principal arguments regarding an express retainer were accordingly rejected. But the claimant had a further argument in the alternative uh, on, on express retainers. Now, it, it was common ground between the parties that an implied retainer was entered in or uh, around January 2016 upon the creation of a conditional fee arrangement. And, and what the claimant sought to argue was that the agreement was retrospective. Uh, that is, the parties agreed that they should be treated as having entered into an express retainer retrospectively as from 19th of May 2014. 
So on the claimant's case, the parties should have been treated as if the defendant always owed the claimant the duties uh, to, to which that conditional fee arrangement gave rise, even if at the time uh, they had not. Now, this argument was dealt with in a different way, uh, namely by reference to the terms of the retainer, uh, the, the terms of the conditional fee arrangement. Shortly put, there was nothing in the conditional fee arrangement which either expressly stated that it was to have that effect um, or from which that consequence could be implied. Clear words, words would be required to achieve that effect, uh, but in the judge, judge's view, such words were lacking. So really, that was it regarding the claimant's case on express retainers. So turning to the arguments on the existence or not of an implied retainer. Now, the claimant's case covered several discrete periods. Uh, and it was alleged that in each or all of these periods, the defendant's conduct was only consistent with the defendant being retained as the claimant's solicitors. Now, the first period related to 19th of May 2014 and shortly afterwards. Now, in the judge's view, the, the defendant's conduct during this period was consistent only with the client claimant being treated as a potential client and not with the defendant being retained as the claimant's solicitor. And, and the central points on this were as follows. Firstly, uh, the defendant did not describe the claimant as their client, at least to her. Secondly, the defendant had opened a file, but that again was an internal matter. It was not communicated to the claimant. Um, and in any event, it was a file which related to her as a potential client, not an actual client. Perhaps most significantly, uh, the defendant had written a letter on the 20th of May 2014, um, in which it was expressly stated that the uh, Miss Pegg, uh, the file handler with the defendant, would contact the claimant to discuss, to quote, discuss whether the defendant was able to accept her case. So that again was suggestive of, of the fact that the claimant was being treated only as a potential client. In cross-examination, the claimant had indicated that the letter suggested in her view that the defendant would be taking on her case following receipt of documents, uh, but the judge held that this was not consistent with what the letter said, uh, objectively, obs objectively assessed. Now, the defendant did record time charges against the file, uh, but again, the judge held that this was not done on, on the basis that the claimant was already liable for fees, uh, merely that she might at some, at some point in time uh, become so liable in the event the file was converted into a retainer. So the second period related to 8th of April 2015 and shortly afterwards. Now, by, by, by this time, the defendant had sent numerous letters to the claimant requesting further information. And by April 2015, the defendant had received some documents, for example, accommodation details and invoice for the holiday. Now, the judge held again that the defendant's conduct during this period was consistent and, in his view, consistent only with the defendant seeking information with a view to deciding whether to offer to enter into a retainer with the claimant. And accordingly, no implied retainer arose during that period either. The third period related to events occurring in the summer of 2015. Now, matters had, had progressed since April 2015, when contact was first made. In May and June 2015, the defendant had obtained the tour operator, tour operator T's and C's. They'd been reviewed, and in counsel's free advice had been obtained. And importantly, they, uh, authority was not sought from the claimant in relation to counsel's advice, and the advice was sought only for the defendant to consider whether they could accept the claim 
In June and July 2015, the defendant had asked for and obtained the claimant's travel insurance documents. That was for the purpose of considering funding. Uh, and in a letter sent in September 2015, the defendant asked about legal expenses insurance and the possibility of a CFA. And that letter was sent to the claimant. There were further inquiries about the accident locus. Uh, and at this stage, the claimant was notified that advice had been obtained um, from counsel. So, so clearly at this stage, the parties are moving closer to a retainer. They're moving closer to a uh, understanding as to the basis, potential basis on which fees could be paid. So legal expenses insurance or a CFA. The defendant's inquiries into liability are ramping up. The terms and conditions have been reviewed. Counsel's advice had been obtained. The claimant was asked some further questions about the accident locus. Um, but even then, that no Im implied retainer had arisen. Um, And the judge deals with this at 113. So even at this stage, the parties were not acting in a way which was only consistent with the defendant having been retained as the claimant solicitors. The issue of funding had still not been resolved. There remained outstanding issues as to the scope of any potential instructions. And on the whole, none of this was consistent only with the parties having entered into a binding retainer. Again, the arrows from the slides over here. So, so that was how the matter was dealt with the first instance. And on appeal, the issue of express and implied retainers played a much less significant role. So in the skeleton, for example, uh, the issues regarding implied retainers only occupied three of the 122 paragraphs of the skeleton. Uh, and the Court of Appeal dealt with the, the, the points in a few short paragraphs. So at 34, Lady Justice Andrews approved the judge's analysis of the uh, events leading up to January 2016. So the claimant was treated only as a prospective client of Owen Mitchell on an objective view of the evidence. Uh, and then at 35, the question of whether an implied retainer arose on 19th of May 2014 uh, was also dealt with. Again, the key point was that on an objective assessment of the evidence, the evidence pointed towards Ms. Miller being treated only as a prospective client and not an actual client. So, so that was how the issues were decided in Miller. And in many ways, I, I think the judgments in Miller represent a, a somewhat orthodox application of, of settled principles regarding when an express or implied retainer will or will not be formed. I think the first instance judgment in particular contains a, a useful summary of those principles uh, and it's a judgment which is well worth reading insofar as any of you have a case uh, involving an issue regarding the existence or not of express or implied retainers. Uh, so I've, I've set out a few of the important cases in, in the slide. And I think generally speaking, there are a number of points to look for when assessing whether an express retainer has or has not been formed. In terms of the alleged offer, you're looking for a written communication or an oral communication, which outlines who is going to do what, uh, when they're going to do it, what they're going to do, uh, and at what cost. Now, there is a caveat on, on the issue regarding fees. It, it is not the case that in the absence of any agreement on fees, there will be no consideration and therefore no retainer. One can imagine cases where, for example, there is a history of dealing between the parties, the solicitor and the client, which would give rise to a 
reasonable presumption that fees would be dealt with in the same manner uh, in the current proceedings. There may also be cases where there is some mutual understanding regarding applicable fees or that fees would be payable under a conditional fee arrangement, um, and that may in some instances be sufficient, even in the absence of specific detail. Really, on the whole, it will all very much depend on, on the facts of a particular case. Now, there was a question that was sent to us before today, uh, which I can probably quickly deal with now. Uh, and the question was, what happens if I'm not working with the retainer? Now, the first point in response is that e even if you don't have a written retainer, that there may well still be an express retainer, albeit one that was agreed via oral discussions. There may also be an implied retainer uh, arising by means of conduct. So even though you, you, you may not think that there is a contractual retainer, you, you may well be wrong about that, uh, depending, of course, on, on the specific circumstances. The, the, the other point to note is that really you're putting yourself at risk a retainer provides a solicitor with a very useful opportunity to specifically set out the scopes and limits of your obligation. And in the absence of a retainer, it will be more difficult to defend the claim um, on, on the basis that, for example, your duty was limited to providing a particular service or providing a particular and uh, discreet advice. Um, so, so really, it's it, it's strongly recommended for um, solicitors to have written retainers in place. Okay, I, th I think that's that's it from me. So I'll, I'll hand over to Andrew, who is going to talk about duties of care in, in tort. Thanks very much, Henk. And um, I've noticed the uh, quite lively discussion in the chat on the issue of owing duties before you're retained. And what I'm going to move on to is precisely that. So when there can be a duty, even though you've not been retained. And this really was the core of the argument in the Court of Appeal, because uh, once the uh, court below had found that there was neither an um, express or an implied retainer, the claimant was left then with a common law duty based on assumption of responsibility. And so this was the core of the appeal. And um, the principles about assumption of responsibility have been considered by um, the uh, courts at a very high level in a number of recent cases. And um, the, sorry, I'm just laughing because I've seen the comment on the chat about assumption of responsibility there from, uh, from one Sarah Prager. Thank you, thank you very much for that. And um, thank you also to the person who's raised their hand. Um, please, um, if you could put what, uh, what you'd like to say in the chat or in a QA, and a then um, I'll try and deal with it. Um, so yes, assumption of responsibility is being considered by the highest courts in a number of recent cases, notably M and Poole, JP, SPC, 4, and the Royal Bank of Scotland, and HXA in Surrey. And all three of those are uh, either Supreme Court or Privy Council. And the point that I take from these, looking at the question of assumption of responsibility from a bird's eye viewpoint, is that the courts are saying that you can't just assert assumption of responsibility in the abstract. And as soon as you start talking about assumption of responsibility, it begs the question, what has what responsibility has been assumed and why? And um, the Supreme Court said this very clearly in the HXA case at the end of last year, um, noting that it's very common to use the language of assumption of responsibility at a high level of generality, but that it helps to sharpen up the analysis to ask what is it alleged that the defendants assumed responsibility to use reasonable care to do? And um, the If I can make this go on to the next slide. Um, oh, I'm, so that leads on to the question of when is there an assumption of responsibility? Well, um, to summarise this, 
And this summary comes from Emin Poole, which again was summarised in the JP SPC case. There's an objective test as to whether there's been an assumption of responsibility. And this requires focusing on things that are said or done by the defendant in their dealings with the claimant. And these have got to all be analysed to see whether any of these cross the line so as to give rise to an assumption of responsibility. And particularly relevant factors are the purpose of the task being done, whether it's for the claimant's benefit rather than some third party. And then mostly, most importantly, whether the defendant um, knew or ought to know that the claimant would be relying on the defendant and the reasonableness of that reliance. Well, that takes me on to the contract, which is all about disclaimers. As I've said, whether the defendant ought to know that the claimant will rely on the defendant and the reasonableness of that reliance. So uh, this is an excellent point to reiterate the disclaimer for this webinar, um, uh, which isn't to be relied on as legal advice, and any liability in respect of the same is disclaimed because the circumstances of cases differ and legal advice on the individual case should always be sought. So um, the purpose of that, and indeed any disclaimer, is to go to these questions of um, whether the defendant ought to know that the claimant will rely on them, and indeed the reasonableness of the claimant's reliance. And the disclaimer goes to both of those limbs, because if I say something in the webinar, having disclaimed liability for it, then I'd argue further down the line that um, I couldn't possibly have known that the claimant would rely on it. And insofar as the claimant did, that was completely unreasonable because of the disclaimer. So um, very good moment to, to bring that up. Normally, people like to um, put disclaimers in small print, but here we can uh, have it front and centre in our interact in the middle of the talk. So moving into the specific area of solicitor's liability, which is, of course, what we're talking about in the Miller case, um, the issue of assumption of responsibility arose in the case of Spire, which was actually decided just around the same time as the first instance decision in Miller. And the judgment was given in Spire by the Court of Appeal after the trial in Miller, but before the judgment had been handed down. And in Spire, the Court of Appeal um, emphasised that assumption of responsibility is the foundation of liability in tort where there is no retainer. So exactly the situation that we're talking about. And the concept is called a voluntary assumption of responsibility. But um, that's potentially misleading because talking about a voluntary assumption of responsibility might suggest that that's a, a voluntary undertaking of responsibility. But actually, uh, the fact that there's been an assumption of responsibility is assumed whether or not these lists are intended to undertake that responsibility, where they actually undertake responsibility for the task. It is the undertaking to answer the question posed which creates the relationship, according to the Court of Appeal and Spire. And um, whether or not there's been an assumption of responsibility and the extent of it is to be judged objectively, as I've said, and quite importantly, without hindsight. And that turned out to be quite an important factor in the Miller case for reasons that we'll come on to. So what examples are there in cases of where there's been an assumption of responsibility? Well, um, there are plenty. And um, one important example is uh, the case of Crossnan. Um, and this is a good example of where uh, an assumption of responsibility was held to have arisen. In that case, the claimant had been involved in a road accident and was being prosecuted. He consulted a solicitor, pre-retainer. Uh, the question of funding arose and the solicitor advised that legal aid wouldn't be available and the claimant had a choice between representing himself or instructing the defendant in paying some money on account. Now, the solicitors did not advise of the third option, which was that the claimant's motor insurers might pay for the defence of his claim. And it was held in that case that having taken it upon himself to advise about how the defence of the claim might be funded, it was incumbent on the solicitor to give the full and complete advice, 
which is to say that there weren't simply two choices, representing himself or paying money up front to the solicitor. But there was a third and probably the most attractive option, which was to um, approach the insurers and, um, and uh, seek their funding for the defence of the claim. So that is um, a key example of where there's an assumption of responsibility and uh, where there was a breach of the duty that had arisen pre-retainer. Um, one point that Hank referred to in the context where there is a retainer is that the retainer will extend to matters that are reasonably incidental to the task precisely being done. Well, how does that work in questions where there's no retainer and it's an assumption of responsibility situation? Well, um, Spire touched on that question and uh, the Court of Appeal left it open. And there are arguments that run both ways. One argument is, if this is something very important, then why shouldn't it be part of the duty that's assumed? Arguments against are that where you have a retainer, you've actually set out the scope of your duties, there's potentially limitation to them. Um, and if you allow um, reasonable, reasonably incidental matters also to be within the ambit of an assumption of responsibility, you're potentially widening the duty very significantly. Well, this issue did arise in the Miller case because one argument that the claimant had was to say that once on the telephone, advice is being given about the limitation period, then advice about the need to inform the tour operator of the accident is reasonably incidental to that. Well, uh, the Court of Appeal didn't answer the question in Miller either. Um, they said that the issue didn't arise because um, advice about informing the tour operator would by no stretch of the imagination be reasonably incidental to advice about the limitation period. So uh, the Court of Appeal don't answer the question in Miller, although they do consider it. And uh, I detect a certain reluctance by the Court of Appeal to widen the ambit of assumption of responsibility to incidental matters or reasonably incidental matters. But the point hasn't been decided yet. It's considered in Spire, it's considered in Miller, and it doesn't actually arise for determination line of either of them. And watch this space to see what happens in the next case where it's a core part of the decision. But um, the claimant uh, said, I don't need to rely on the question of reasonably incidental, that the duty I'm contending for arose as part of the assumption of responsibility. And what were the claimant's arguments for that? Well, the claimant said that the defendant uh, held itself out as ready and able to assist uh, victims of accidents, that they operated something called a legal helpline. That's to say a telephone line that people could ring if they needed help, in particular legal help that there was no disclaimer or exclusion of responsibility or liability. That would go to the question of reasonable reliance, as I've said. And the claimant was given some legal advice on the helpline, uh, with the operator never saying that that advice was incomplete or that the claimant shouldn't rely on it, or that the claimant should seek advice elsewhere about steps to protect her position. Um, I mean, the summary is the claimant said that um, the defendant assumed a, res a responsibility to take reasonable care in respect of the advice that was provided over the legal helpline. And dealing with that simple question, the judge at first instance accepted that, and the Court of Appeal accepted that. If you're providing advice, then you owe a duty in respect of that advice. Um, and so far as that advice went, it was reasonable for the claimant to rely on it, and the advice provided was correct. Well, the claimant's argument is that um, whilst uh, literally speaking, the advice provided was correct, they contended that the advice was actually incomplete and therefore misleading because advising the claimant on limitation gave her the impression that nothing needed to be done to preserve the claim, that the, she had um, pretty much three years in which to bring an action without any important steps that needed doing in the meantime. And the claimant's argument was that just wasn't correct because the claimant did need to tell the tour operator about the fact of the accident. And if the claimant didn't do that, then there was a risk that the tour operator might fail to notify their insurers 
leaving the claimant with an uninsured defendant, exactly as what happened. And um, the Court of Appeal completely rejected that argument, uh, which was essentially trying to say that um, advising to tell the insurer was part of advising on limitation. They disagreed with that, saying that it was wrong to say there were additional steps that the claimant needs to do to preserve her right of action. It was absolutely right that the claimant could wait three years to preserve her right of action. The issue that the claimant wanted advice about, or uh, that the claim was against the solicitors was about, was something different, which is to say the solvency of the tour operator and the need for the tour operator to have insurance. And the um, Court of Appeal disagreed that advising about limitation was essentially tantamount to advising about all steps uh, given to protect the claimant's position more widely. And given the context of the call, the fact that it was clearly just preliminary and that the case was going to be referred further and was, the Court of Appeal said that the claimant couldn't possibly have thought that she was being given wider range, wider ranging and comprehensive advice uh, at the stage of the legal line call. Um, I touched on this a moment ago. Essentially, another argument for the claimant was that the, the risk that the tour operator had failed to notify their insurer was a hidden pitfall, something which the legal advisor could have contemplated but that the claimant uh, wouldn't have known about, and therefore something that the claimant needed advice on. And the Court of Appeal uh, rejected this, saying that... Um, what the risk was, was that the tour operator both knew of the accident and had already failed to report it. And the Court of Appeal considered that that was quite a remote risk because that would require the tour operator acting against their own interests by not reporting something when they had this obligation and failing to have in place um, a, uh, a proper system for reporting things to their insurers. And that there wasn't any general duty to take steps to safeguard against that risk unless the tour operator had some specific information that this tour operator had a solvency problem. And the Court of Appeal referred to an earlier case, which we put in in a respondent's notice, uh, Pearson and Sanders Witherspoon. And that made the general proposition that it isn't part of the solicitor's duties to safeguard against the risk of unenforceability of a judgment because of insolvency by the other party, unless there is something specific to put the solicitor on notice that that might be a problem. Um, and here, the judge found at first instance that this particular tour operator, low cost, that there was nothing to put them at any um, greater risk of insolvency than any other tour operator at the time. And it's also relevant that at the time of the phone conversation, what um, the potential claim that was being spoken about was a claim for a nasty leg fracture not a particularly high value claim, one that might well fall within the tour operator's excess anyway. And it was only much later in the course of the claim that it developed into a much more serious claim for a leg amputation and care and accommodation and all the things that go with that. So what does this mean for the future? Well, one important issue that comes out of the discussion that the Court of Appeal had in the course of the appeal and has found its way into the judgment from the Court of Appeal is um, whether or not there is a positive obligation to advise on limitation if the limitation period is likely to expire. Now, this didn't arise in the Miller case for two reasons. Firstly, at the time of the legal helpline call, limitation was nowhere near expiring. And secondly, the legal advisor in the helpline call did in fact advise perfectly correctly on limitation. But what if the facts had been a bit different? What if it was almost three years after the accident and the claimant telephoned the helpline shortly before the expiry of the limitation period? Would there be a duty on the legal advisor to say limitations about to expire, you need to issue this claim ASAP? Well, the Court of Appeals say that this is strongly arguable, and they don't say how exactly that would fit into the legal analysis. Um, but um, watch this space, because it may well be that we have a case where somebody isn't advised about limitation, free retainer, and is saying there's a common law duty to do that.
And the Court of Appeals say, as I say, without deciding this, that that would be strongly arguable. Um, what about any other obligatory steps that a claimant needs to take to actually safeguard their claim? And again, another issue that arose um, in discussion in the Court of Appeal, one of the claimant's arguments was what about if it's a case for criminal injuries compensation, where the claimant is required to have informed the police about the criminal injury in order to be entitled to any criminal injury compensation? And my view is that's probably something quite similar to advising on limitation. That's potentially a hidden pitfall, something that's quite important that the claimant does that they're, claim that they're not going to know about. Um, the argument would have to be that by providing any advice at all, the um, solicitors were under a duty to provide advice about these things. How exactly that arises is an issue for another day, and it would need to go through the assumption of responsibility analysis on the facts of that particular case. But presumably it would need to be on the basis that by providing any advice at all, you have to provide advice about these other matters, which are these hidden pitfalls, steps that need to be taken or taken urgently, otherwise the claim will be completely lost. So this takes me on to my conclusions from this section. Um, as I say, assumption of responsibility cases are highly fact sensitive. They need to be carefully analysed. But in general terms, pre-retainer, a potential client, assuming it's reasonable, is entitled to rely on any advice that's provided at that stage. And the point that I was just making before this, uh, this slide, there may well be a duty to advise on um, matters such as limitation or any other essential hidden pitfalls, even pre-retainer. Um, one other point is that both Miller and Spire are cases of the courts rowing back somewhat on the widening of assumption of responsibility and liability generally beyond what the solicitor has actually taken upon themselves to do. But there may be an exception to this. And as I say, the question of limitation could be one of those things. So that's the conclusion of the formal part of our, of our talk. Um, if anyone has any questions, then please do put them in the Q&A. We did have some uh, questions um, before the start of the session, and I know that Henk has dealt with one of them. And um, the, another question that we had was what the relationship is between um, pre-retainer and when there is a retainer but the client isn't paying fees. And the answer that I would give to that is I think that they are different situations because so long as there is a retainer, then it's the retainer that's going to be the main foundation of the, the duties and the duties are going to continue as long as the retainer continues. But before the retainer, it's necessary to look at whether there is an assumption of responsibility to do the thing in question. Um, we've had yeah, a lot of lively discussion on the chat, which Hank and I are just uh, looking at at the moment. I'm not sure the last one is. is it? But um, if we have any other Q&As, please do put them uh, in the Q&A box now. Otherwise, um, do feel free to email myself or Hank our um, email addresses are on the, uh, on the screen at the moment. Yes, so I've just seen in the chat about the criminal injuries compensation. So as I say, this is something that the claimants argued in the Court of Appeal. They said that informing the floor operator about the accident was similar to the obligation to notify the police in a CICA case. And the answer which we gave and which the Court of Appeal agreed with is that actually that's completely different to notifying the tour operator about the accident. Because if you don't notify the tour operator about the accident, it doesn't affect whether or not you can sue the tour operator for the claim. But in the CICA, you obviously, that's the opposite. If you don't inform the police about the accident, then you can't um, bring your claim for CICA compensation. Well, um, there aren't any questions in the Q&A, I don't think. So uh, assuming that there are no more questions from anybody, then um, Hank and I will uh, wrap this up at this point and say thank you very much to everyone for attending. And thank you for um, contributing to the discussion in the chat. Um, I hope it was a useful session. And um, I hope to um, 
see you in person soon. Um, thank you very much to everyone once again. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone.